Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Well, hello and welcome to Kingdom Stories, where we bring you testimonies of people who have walked with the Lord and have had tremendous impact, uh, both in society and also in, in the church. People who have journeyed for a long time uh, with Jesus and are seasoned and have a, a, a wonderful story to tell us. Today, we have a special guest, Dr. John Yates. Um, I've known John for about uh, 25 years, I think, since the days of West Australian Bible College, and no longer uh, after that, uh, Dr. Job, uh, Bob Chapman introduced me to uh, John, and um, it's just wonderful to have him here tonight. He was born in Melbourne um, to non Christian parents, grew up in Adelaide, he had a diverse education, um, and um, with university aspirations. Uh, became progressively depressed and paranoid. He was led to reading the Bible, and after reading the Bible, he got converted. Uh, he had a Pentecostal experience and uh, attended church, of course. Met his wife, Donna, through Christian fellowship at uni, and then he worked as a high school teacher in science, biology, and maths. Later on, he went to Melbourne to do theology degree at Ridley College, Surprisingly, ended up in an Anglican church after the Pentecostal experience. He served in country Victoria parishes, beginning of long sequences of rejections by church leadership, went to Brisbane to do a PhD in philosophy, uh, philosophical theology, and then called to a prophetic ministry of the Word. And then he was called to come to Perth, to, to our wonderful city, to work with uni students here in Perth. And I won't give away too much right now because there's quite a bit of story in there but he's had his run with the churches a few times. Uh, he has been recalled back to an Anglican church at the moment in Bassendine, where he works principally with men. He does ministry in Myanmar, divides his time between mentoring and spiritual direction, and also writing his own blog and uh, also website. He's been involved in establishing several marketplace networks in Western Australia for Christian professional, uh, professionals as part of a commitment to the discipling of the nation and uh, he will seek to leave a legacy behind and I won't give that away because I think it's important that we hear it from John. John, man, your, bio, your biography is just wonderful. We are privileged to have you tonight here at Kingdom Stories. It's good to be here. You've, you've, uh, so you've come from a background, non-Christian background. I wouldn't have known that. I wouldn't have guessed that. Well, there's no reason why you should guess it, but um, I think even though I was born 1951, when most people in Australia, over 90% actually, would have said they were Christians, they were nominal Christians. Yes. I mean, really nominal. Just they thought, well, I'm not a, a Hindu or a Buddhist or Muslim or something, so I'm a Christian. So people believed in the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, but they never read the Bible. Okay. They rarely pray, prayed. Maybe Was there they church, went, church attendance? Maybe, maybe they went to church. Um, my mother went to church and sometimes my sister, my father did not. So I grew up not going to church um, and well, God was there somewhere, but he wasn't real. You had no spiritual awareness? Uh, I would say I had no spiritual awareness. And things started to change a bit. Um, I remember when I was 15 years old and that was the age my mother and father said I could go out by myself. Okay. And I remember the first time I went out of a Saturday night to a party or a dance, I think it was. Uh, this so, in Melbourne or in Adelaide? No, this was in Adelaide. Okay. Well, by this time I was in Adelaide. Yeah. Um, I met someone who said he had half a bottle of wine to sell. <laughs> I said, I'll buy it. So I drank it straight there and of course got very drunk, um, which was a sign I actually underneath was really struggling. I'd say struggling existentially. Yes. That means what is the meaning of exi existence? And I remember my friends saying sometime along the, the stretch. Yes. And they're all non-Christian friends. Yeah. 
um, you've always believed in hell, but you never were sure that heaven was there. Okay. This was after I came yeah. to Christ. Yeah, yeah. They told me that. And I remember going to parties and stuff and always trying to drink. Even though the legal age of drinking in South Australia at that time was 21. Not 18. Not 18. So we used to work out ways of actually getting alcohol. As you do. <laughs> As you do. Um, yeah, I was really stretched um, in my being as to why I was around. And that became even more intense uh, when I went to university. So you questioned existence, why, why are you well, here? Well, yes, it was quite a deep questioning. And I think um, I'd see the hand of God in that. Yeah. Because Where were you looking? Were you looking in books? Where, what, were you, well, what, what were you reading? Who were you well, asking? I wasn't, I wasn't actually reading anything at the time. Yeah. Uh, but I think I was just miserable. But this is where it gets more interesting, more overt. That is the more obvious hand of God. Yeah. I remember, and I, I was really in a bad way. Uh, by the time I got to university, mm -hmm. that, that's smart about this. It was I was in a bad way. Uh, I remember I had all the skin condition. Okay. And I went to a dermatologist. He said it's psychosomatic. I was having these pains in my chest. Uh, I went to a um, heart specialist. Yes. And he said it's psychosomatic. So I was... Um, so two side effects. I, I was manif manifesting the cost to a human soul of rebellion against God. And I was also paranoid, and, and you mentioned that, but it's easy to talk about paranoia. What were you afraid of? Um, I'll tell you in a moment. <laughs> I was really afraid of people. Okay. So I used to simply go through from home mm -hmm. to the university and back. I was too afraid to walk down a public street, literally. Yeah. And I was doing really well at university because that was, what else was I going to do? Yeah. Uh, I remember being in the university library in one of my bleak, dark states, that yep. is depression, which no one knew about except me and, of course, God knew about it. But did you know you had a condition or...? Well, of course I had a condition. <laughs> no, no, but were you aware? Were you fully...? Oh, I was aware that I was daily miserable and I needed yep. something to get me out of it. So here I am, sitting in the university library, thinking, what is the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. This was the um, well, was about the, the seventies were times like this, right? Yeah. Uh, where people were really questioning everything. Everything was being questioned. I'll come to that later, perhaps. But there I was. Not necessarily a bad thing. Um, now, if God's hands on it, which in this case it was, yeah, it is a good thing. Yes. Right. But if we only ask questions about our, of ourselves from our own psyche, that will just destroy us. Yeah. Yeah. So the hand of God's on me, obviously. I didn't know that at the time. So there I was thinking, I was trying to be logical. Yep. Because by this time in my life, I'd become very rationalistic. Now, hopefully, whoever watches this understands that trusting in reason. And uh, anyway, I was doing psychology and as well as biology and some other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was trying to work all this out. and. But there I was, I think, okay, if there's meaning in life, it has to be more than this life. Yeah. Because rich or poor, sickness, health, if you die and there's nothing other than this life, it's all meaningless. It's zero. Yeah. Which people today would probably call nihilistic. That's just emptiness. So then I thought, okay, life after death. Well, I'm a biology student. I know everything just breaks down and decomposes. Yeah. Uh, that would have to involve a miracle. Then I thought, well, a miracle, well, that would have to involve a God, something outside of this space-time network. Then I thought, hmm, well, how do you know about God? People reckon you know about God through the Bible. I, I said to myself, well, one day you should read the Bible. Yep. Didn't think any more about it. Anyway, the next, the next day, yep. when I came home from the university, on our kitchen table was a big box of books. Okay. And most of them were novels from neighbours down the street. But amongst them was the New Testament. So I took hold of the New Testament, put it up my jumper, because my father, I thought he might ridicule me from reading, from reading the Bible, because he was, he was really atheistic. Yep. I had suffered a lot in World War II and had various physical illnesses. 
so I started to read the Bible by myself. Yeah. And I couldn't stop reading it. I got a, a Bible out of university library. And so I read the Bible through a couple of times in the next nine months. So you you began with the New Testament, but then you wanted the whole Yeah, I wanted the whole, the whole Bible. Yeah. Um, because you can't understand the whole Bible without the whole Bible. Yeah. Um, so every day as I was reading the Bible, I was under the fear of the Lord. Okay. Now I'd be, I'd be more precise here. And, you know, language is an interesting thing. The churches are full of, full of people who use biblical language in a, in a way they don't understand. So it's easy to talk about the fear of hell, but if, but if you haven't experienced it, you don't know what it is. So sure. every day when I woke up, I was terrified of dying that day. And I mean terrified. I really believe it was the fear. This is while you were reading the Bible or before? Well, because I was reading the Bible. Oh, because you were reading the Bible. I'm reading the Bible. The Bible talks about the wrath of God and the judgment of God. You know, the the, the, the fire of their um, suffering goes up forever and ever. They have no peace day and night. Not pretty. No. Well, I mean, it was... Well, anyway, I was terrified. And uh, I heard about this Christian group at the university. Yep. And I thought, I need to go and talk to these people and tell them I'm convinced by the scriptures. I want to follow Jesus, whatever that means. Okay. Um, So I have this thesis, when you know how people came to Christ, you actually understand them. All right. So anyway, there was a religious center in the university. They're holding meetings in there. So I remember coming to the door. And I knew there were Christians inside. And when I got to the door, I was paralyzed. Couldn't move. Yeah. Now, how do you explain that? On one level, you can explain it psychologically. You can explain anything you like psychologically, actually. But I, re- I reckon it was also demonic. Okay. So I couldn't move. I couldn't go through the door. Um, was it like the paranoia kicked in? Well, it was so like, like there was a force field there. Okay. All right. So I, I turned back. Okay. So anyway, it's, it's the same time the following week, I thought, this time I've got to go through that door. Because the fear of hell was much bigger than it the fear of anything you. that was inside <laughs> of that door. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah? yeah. So this time I got through and I came to these people and I said, look, um, this is me. I've, I've been reading the Bible. Yep. I want to follow Jesus. Yep. And they were a bit shocked. But they did help me and that was the beginning of the story, really. And, and there was sort of all sorts of other interesting episodes over the next... So they led you to the Lord? Well, I think the Lord led me to the Lord, actually. Yeah, but they helped? They helped. Yeah, it was a good environment. You. Yeah, it was a good environment. They, they, they loved Jesus, um, but they're very much coming alongside a sovereign work of grace. Okay. Because during this period when I was reading the Bible and going through all these traumas, and um, I was talking to a couple of people who later came to Christ themselves. Yeah. But they weren't, there's no way they were Christians. Okay. So it really was the sovereign hand of God, and I think that's important. I think it's always the sovereign hand of God. Sure. Um, but anyway, that, that was the beginning of the story. In and church? Did you well, join yeah, the church? Actually, or um, did you just go to the uni? Uh, no, I, Gathering. I, I did go to church. And um, what had happened is I was talking to one of my classmates who was also doing a uh, degree in biology. Yeah. And he'd had a church background. So he wasn't a Christian. Yeah. And he talked about David Wilkerson and the okay. book The Cross and Switchblade. Okay. So he lent me that book, which I devoured. So when I came to these Christian folk yep. at the university, I said, I want to go to one of these churches. Because I'd read about being baptized in the Spirit and speaking in tongues okay. and the work of God. Yep, yep, yep. And they said, all right, we know one. We'll send you this one. Uh, which was good for a while, for, for a number of years. It was a Pentecostal church. You went through the whole... Spirit feeling experience yeah, and speaking remember, in tongues. I, I, and... I remember um, a little while after I started going to the church, I thought, I really need this, the power of the Spirit. And I said, I'm going home after, after church one night. I can't remember what time it was. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was really resolute. I'm going to get on my knees and pray until I'm filled with the Spirit. And it happened. And, and there I was praying and crying and speaking in tongues for hours. And about one o'clock in the morning, I thought, oh, I've got to go to university tomorrow. I better go to sleep. Yeah. Which I did. So the Lord does things like that when we're hungry, I think. Beautiful. 
If we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we'd be satisfied. There was, there was a go- uh, an emptiness inside of you for that. Well, well, definitely. Good. And then, when did you meet your wife? Well, all sorts of thing, interesting things happened. I was having demonic manifestations, which... Um, I could be in a meeting, this is quite early on, and yeah. all of a sudden I couldn't see anything. Okay. I just couldn't see anything. I, things went black and there was other few things like, you know, some shaking and stuff. And But eventually that was dealt with in a, in a really, a way that honoured the word of the Lord. Yeah. Is people try to cast demons out of me, which yeah. is, that's all right. Um, but I was having these manifestations at lunchtime when I was at the university, and then some guys took me to see a pastor, a Pentecostal pastor. Yes. And he quoted the scripture to me in a certain way that was really quite settled. But actually hearing him ended that demonic problem. Wow. Right? Because the, the scripture was in James about um, not, hearing, not only being hearing the word of the Lord, but doing the word of the Lord. Yeah. And that solved the problem. I think that's another example of how God um, elevate, elevated the Bible yes. in my experience. The power of the Word. Definitely. So there it is. Uh, the Word was there, firstly, and the Spirit was there. Yeah. Which means the two hands of, hands of God the Father were there, as, as one of the other church fathers would say. Yeah. So there, yeah, I was part of the Christian Fellowship Group, and I was in my honours year. That's my fourth year. And my wife was there in her first year doing economics degree. And that's how we met. In the Christian fellowship? In the Christian fellowship. So she was a believer? Uh, absolutely. She grew up in a... She grew Christian... up in the church. Okay, okay. And um, how did it happen? You met her after the service? Or... Well, no, mainly because um, she lived on the same side of town Okay. as I did. Yeah. So someone had to take her home. And that would turn out to be me. <laughs> no more paranoia for you. No more driving home on your own. No more. Well, well, look. Um, paranoia hasn't been a big thing since those early days. Yeah. But um, I wasn't an easy person to get on with. Okay. I still am not an easy person to get on with, but probably in a different. But she way. accepted you. Well, she did because. She would say she remembers exactly where she was when the Lord said, that's your husband. Okay. And, and, and it's important that she heard that. Yes. Because I could, I was very difficult. Right. Now you're smiling as you always do. Uh, but a lot of other fiancés yes. would not have continued to the marriage. Okay. Now I don't want to go on. And describe that. Yeah, yeah. So for her, it was very painful the way I treated her. She needed that confirmation from the Lord. Well, absolutely, in advance. Yeah. But she had it. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, God prepares us for things yet to come. And we only know that when it happens. How did you propose to her? Uh, well, basically, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, I had an invitation to go to someone's wedding, I think it was. Okay. And I said, I'd like you to come to, with the, to this wedding with me, yep. but you need to understand if you come with me, we're going to get married. Oh. Because I, did, I didn't, I mean, I, I could never comprehend the dating thing. Yes. Right. I still can't, actually. <laughs> I, I know, you don't need to. I know people of, uh, how do I put this, weaker brothers and sisters, <laughs> right? God makes allowance for that, uh, but I could never comprehend that. Yeah. I didn't need to, as it happened. So she accepted to go to the wedding yeah. and be married? Because she Lord already, already, Lord already spoken to her. Okay. <laughs> you know? You, so you got married in Adelaide? Yeah, I got married in Adelaide and... Um, yeah. And you began ministry? Uh, no, 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 hang on. You haven't gone to school yet. Uh, no, look, so... Goes. So... Um, I was doing my honours degree and I remember... You don't have to keep watching the time here, brother. That's fine. Uh, I, I remember my honours uh, supervisor coming up and said, uh, have you thought about doing a PhD in biology? Okay. Immediately he spoke to me, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, no. Okay. A little while later, he came up again. 
The Holy Spirit said no. Before I could pray. Yeah. Before I could ask the Lord. Yeah. Right? God gave me no choice but not to go on that route of okay. science. Yeah. And then some other things happened. I got guidance to um, do something I never would have done unless I'd been guided by the Spirit, which was to be a school teacher. <laughs> because my um, I'd been a really bad student. Okay. Right? I've been a poor student, disrespectful of teachers, had a low opinion of teachers, yeah. school teachers, but the Lord clearly directed me. Okay. I went into the um, um, same university library, actually, and this time I had a Bible, and I said, Lord, I think you want me to go to school teaching. Show me. Now, never do this. No. I, I opened the Bible. I said, Lord, you've got to guide me, put my finger... On, on a scripture which said all that Jesus began to do and teach. <laughs> right? So I knew. That's casting lots for you. Yeah, well, God had, he's sovereign. So he just said, go school teaching, which I did for four years. First year was really bad and difficult, but by the end of the fourth year, I knew how to manage classes, yeah. mastered the subject material, and the Lord um, showed me I should go to Melbourne to the Anglican Theological College, Ridley College, yep. which had a good reputation mm -hmm. as, as a scholarly place and Bible yep. believing. And so I, I had um, started off with the Pentecostals. We moved house, um, which gave me a reason to stop going to that particular church. Besides which, they were so um, anti-intellectual. Okay. They were really anti old style Pentecostals in yeah. Australia, yeah. anti-intellectual. They're good people, godly people. Sure. Um, but we were Baptists for a little while, my wife's old church. And then, so when we went to Melbourne, we were Baptists. Yep. But we were living on campus, close to the middle of Melbourne, actually. Mm -hmm. And they had a rule, if you live on campus, you go to College Chapel, which, of course, was Anglican. Yep. So we felt after a while the Lord was saying, I want you in the Anglican ministry. Okay. Well... That proved fairly difficult because I tried to get into the Diocese of Melbourne. They said no. I tried to get into the Diocese of New England in New South Wales. They said yeah. no. And then this, uh, I was in my third year. There was this visiting theologian from the UK yep. who took a liking to me because, how do I put this? I ended up to topping Australia in my course. Wow. Right? I Love wouldn't that. say, well, I worked too hard. I was too driven. That's a serious comment, right? You had to prove to I yourself something. Prove, I have to prove something, which was really unhealthy. Anyway, he said, oh, I'm going up to see the Bishop of Wangaratta, which okay. is northeast Victoria. Yep. I'll put, on, put in a word for you. And I thought, okay. oh, all right. Anyway, he did. So I ended up um, in the Diocese of Wangaratta for four years in Shepparton and Wodonga, which is sort of nice country uh, town. And what was your wife doing? What was she working? Uh, she did some relief teaching, but we had a couple of kids by this time. Okay, so she, she didn't mind moving along with you? Well, she was called to be my husband. Uh, your wife? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, she, she was called to be my wife. So, yeah, so yeah. she just follows her? Oh, well, of course, we prayed about things. Okay. Yeah, of course, but you know, if, if God's going to speak to me, yeah. he'll speak to her too. Of course. Yeah, of course. And uh, so you're, you're, you stayed up in Wangaratta or you stayed up in Bendigo? Yeah, well, in Shepparton. Shepparton. Okay. Shepparton and, um, and Wodonga. Okay. It was re really Wodonga. interesting, you know, because um, even though most of this came out afterwards, um, I was surrounded by gays, gay priests. Okay. Uh, I was but working. at the time you didn't know? No. Came out later, they both ended up on charges Okay. for molesting boys. Mm. Came out later. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, but it was that sort of a diocese. But we, we had a good time there. The Lord protected you from oh, well, of course. all that yeah, well, nastiness. Yeah. yeah. Except when I went to, Wang, um, to Wodonga, it's very interesting. Uh, the guy I worked with in Wodonga, it only lasted a year. Yeah. And um, 
I did most of uh, most of the ministry in a sort of daughter church. He was completely burnt out. He tried high church Anglicanism. He yep. tried charismatic. Yep. Um, when I first met him, he came in talking about um, his trip uh, to to meet the Buddhists in Japan. Okay. So he was all over the place, and I was young and didn't know what I was dealing with. Yeah. Uh, but he would never talk to me. Okay. And to make a long story short, I heard on the grapevine that I, I would have to be moved. It turned out he said to the bishop, if you don't move John, I'll starve him out. I'll stop sending funds for his stipend to the diocese. I rang the bishop up. I said, what's going on? The bishop told me the story. He said, if you can convince Alan uh, that, you, that for him, for you to stay there, that's all right. Yep. If you can't convince him, I'll have to shift you. Okay. Uh, anyway, I couldn't convince him. The people went went to him in tears, and all, but he wouldn't change his mind. Oh, that was very interesting because, well, summarizing this, I refused uh, not to forgive him. Right? Yes. Because I wasn't going to let any human person get in the way of my relationship with the Lord. Mm-hmm. So I made this very clear to him I'd forgiven him. Yes. Very clear to him. Yep. And he knew that. Yep. And so I went on with the Lord the next year. I was so two years in Shepparton, year in Wodonga. That, was, that means instead of two years. Yep. Year back in Shepparton, we saw a real move of God yep. in Shepparton. Got my, my master's degree finished. I was work, still working too hard. Yeah. Um, you did that by distance? Yeah. Then? Okay. Yeah, by distance. With Ridley as well? No, it was through Deakin University. Okay. So, yeah, then we went up to uh, Brisbane <laughs> and ended up in a cult. Now, Anglican churches don't have cults, but this one did. <laughs> okay. I, won't, I won't go through too much here. Yeah, yeah. But let me just say, uh, summarizing, uh, that the priest was away and he said, you can preach. Yes. Uh, and I preached on unity in the church. Yeah. Little did I know I was being secretly recorded. Okay. Because they used to do things like, if they wanted to teach someone, someone a lesson, to yeah. bring them in line to submit, they would physically get some people, stop them actually leaving the church. Okay. And then they'd lecture them take away their ministry until they submitted. Okay. So this proved to be really... Did you get get that as well? No, what I got was I was asked to take a daughter church. Okay. Yeah, which went really well. Okay. Because I was there every every Sunday, preach to the people, visit the people. Yes. So they, they asked if they could pay for me to live in the area. Yes. While I did my studies. Yeah. Next thing I know, there's a letter in my letterbox um, put in there by this uh, priest in charge saying, uh, you're no longer welcome in this parish, your family's no longer welcome, you have to leave. So I rang him up. I History said, repeats. I, I said, to, uh, Tom, what's this about? Oh, anyway, he starts to shout at me. Look, his wife, who was even more demonic, <laughs> start, started to shout at the top of her voice, you're the, you're the least Christian person I've ever met. You're of the devil. And uh, it really got strange. Yes. Anyway, there's a bit more in that. Uh, so we... Of course, Very colourful. Uh, well, yeah. And there are other people that he'd abused. I mean, spiritually abused. Yeah. And we, we talked to some of the church leaders about it. I mean, archdeacons and stuff. Yeah. But we left and went to another parish and that went well. It was more charismatic, really charismatic parish. But he was charismatic too. Okay. But, Very charismatic. Well, he was... He Colourful was, charismatic. Well, he was... It, you, had to, you had to experience it to believe it. Okay. You wouldn't believe it otherwise. So you finished your PhD in Brisbane? Yes, I finished the PhD and um, someone who I knew that had gone down from Brisbane to Ridley met someone from Perth and people in Perth were looking for someone to work with university students. So they flew me over to have a chat and... That's how you ended up in Perth. Yes, well, there's some complexities in that too. So what year was this? 90... 88. 88, okay. Uh, it turns out they hadn't made a final decision 
until we were on the Nullarbor plane. But they hadn't told us that yet. Yes. So you were driving across? Oh, yeah, we'd drive across with our four children by then. And um, interestingly, the, um, the charismatics didn't want me to come. Yeah. Uh, and the anti charismatics did want me to come. This is all in the Anglican Church, right? Yeah, all in the Anglican Church. And it was a, it was a mixed church. But anyway, that went all interesting. Oh, yeah, I saw a lot of growth there. Yeah. <laughs> so where, where did you end up in Perth? What uh, in parish? St. Sa- Matthew's in Shenton Park. Okay. Large evangelical church, conservative okay. evangelical church. Uh, but I had problems. I so had you were problems. hired as a, as a priest there, as a minister? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was in the staff. And How long did you last there? Um, three years. Oh, that's that's pretty good for your record, isn't but it? But anyway, uh, there were some different differences between uh, the rector, that's the guy in charge, and me. Yeah. They looked like they were theological. Yes. They weren't. Uh, I was looking for a different sort of father in God than him. Now, okay. I couldn't articulate that at the time. Yeah. But eventually he said, you have to go. And I, and I thought, this is a bit too much. And anyway. Um, and then the hand of the Lord appeared really clearly. Someone rang me up and said, who'd been in the UK, actually, been away. Yep. He said, do you know about what, what they're doing with the, the buildings in um, West Leadable? I said, no. He said, there's a rectory there, there's a hall there, and there's a church building there. They want to sell it. Why don't you think about talking to the Archbishop and we'll do a church plant out of this place? Okay. Archbishop was happy, Down the rector the was happy, all the authorities were happy. So I took about a third of the people and From re- Shenton Park and moved yep. to West Leadable. We planted them in West Leadable and that was all right for a few years. Well, that was pretty much your church per se, in the sense. Yes, it was. There wasn't a lot of. External influence. Well, no, there wasn't, but there was a lot of internal influence. Okay. So was it the elders that you took with you or some of the establishment or um, new people that no, came it through? No, was, it was, there was no one there, right? Yeah. So we just really replanted from scratch. Um, but let's call them the elders. Okay. But they had a view of what they wanted from church. Yes. And what they wanted from me. Yeah. I kept saying to them, there's a prophetic call on my life. And they said, no, 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 we want a pastor. Okay. Um, until eventually one day I was preaching now of course there's much more detail than this yes I was preaching uh, and there was I I call it a riot in the church yep Uh, one guy stood up and started to shout at me this is while you're speaking yeah while I'm preaching and other people started to break down and cry and and people started to leave and one guy at the back stood up and pointed the finger at me and said, you're in this for the money, you're in this for the car, and this, there was mayhem. Now, unfortunately, two of our two oldest children were there, which was very damaging for them. Yes. But everybody left, um, and then the elders said to me later, yeah. you have to go, and I said, you can't tell me to go. If God tells me to go, I'll go. Yeah. But you can't tell me to go, because in, in the Anglican system, they can't do that anyway. Sure. All right? So I said, you can't tell me to go. Yeah. Simple. So it was really difficult. And I was out praying one day. And I felt the Lord say, leave the parish, leave the Anglican church. I said, right here. I never had problems with the archbishop. So he wasn't the problem. But anyway, I sent him a letter saying, I think I need to resign. And then I was with house church people uh, who had a different perspective altogether. Yeah. Uh, but obviously there was no more money then. You, money. You couldn't, well, yeah. At least when you were pastoring well, the, the church, you could get a was, salary wage. Um, what turned up was a part-time position lecturing at Ridley College. Okay. Not Ridley College. A Tabor table. College. Here. Yeah, at ta- Tabor College. Okay. So I sort of took over responsibility for the theology side of things. Sure. Which was available after I left. Perfect. God's got a way of providing. Yeah. So there we were in the house churches. Uh, we, I, I still have contacts with people in house churches. And let's just say the tensions between the main leader and me got more and more uh, until one day he came around to visit me and he said, 
Uh, I'll let you come to my meetings, but that's it. Nothing else. Yeah. I said, all right. I was relieved. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I didn't want to get into an argument sure. about anything. But, but anyway, so then we were in a few other places. And on, on, on the, oh, this year, you like this one. <laughs> I, I was on the staff of a largest Church of Christ. Okay. Uh, that'll do. And uh, after a while, the chairman of the elders uh, in particular didn't like me. And he was praying with some women okay. in the church. Yep. And uh, I don't think that was healthy, actually. But, but anyway, um, the elders called me in a few times and eventually said, you have to leave. We'll okay. pay you out to the end of the year. But leave now. Out. Yeah, that's it. Now, a few years later, that particular man who was chairman of the elders, yeah. said, I, said, he said, I have been manipulated. Forgive me. Okay. Now, I knew he'd been manipulated. Yes. He came in one day, yeah. a little bit earlier than this, you know, Yep. And he said, I think you've got the spirit of Jezebel. And I'm thinking... I How do you know? I, th I thought, and I was thinking, isn't that women have the spirit of Jezebel? <laughs> and I said, well, what evidence do you have? He said, oh, I like a few of the things in your writings. And it just, it just, yeah. that was his problem. Yeah. It was influenced. Yeah, I could go into detail about that. But anyway, that was good that he, the Lord had spoken to him. And your wife patiently... My wife's always patient. Hang, hang on, you know, Yeah, she, she started she... doing school teaching and... Was she affected by some of these? Of course, of she was affected. Yeah. How did? How I'll tell did you she how I was affected. Go on. Um, I'm still affected. The riot. Yes. At Saint Barnabas. Uh, was really traumatic, and I remember when I was at um, Tabor, speaking to the principal, uh, and the chairman of the board about a matter. Yep. which I thought was out of order okay. in the college. And they yeah. agreed with me, actually. Yeah. And I had a really strong flashback to mm. that event. So since then, I've never had settled sleep once. Now, now, the Lord's put his hand on me a couple of times in very interesting circumstances. Once, when I went back to St. Barnabas, uh, I was invited to go back for the 20th anniversary of reopening yes and the other when a, a Coptic Orthodox priest prayed for me and I was with Jesus on the way to the cross I have to say it that way yeah and and when they were shouting at him I could sense all the shouting that had come to me during the riot was yeah he'd taken that it was a really powerful experience yes but but anyway so yeah um, trauma you grow through it if you trust the Lord so it's affected you, your wife, and your children. Two yes. of your children were there. You were yeah, saying. well, it's affected everybody because they got used to me being rejected. Mm -hmm. But the Lord has never rejected me. No. He's pr protected me. See, some strange things happening right now. What, why, what do you think people don't get about you, John? What do they... Well, look, um, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's okay. Revelation 19.10. Yeah. I've been in, in various meetings where I've been praying yes. or made a comment yeah. quite, in a quite settled way. Yes. And people have gone off their head. I mean, started to shout at me. Okay? When you began to prophesy? Or? No, just when I was praying. Okay. Or when I made a comment about something. And look, I've been in... Um, um, I know the scriptures. I know Jesus Christ. Okay which is more than a lot of people in authority know. And is it because you have the courage to say it? I wouldn't call it courage. I remember being in a meeting uh, and a lot of people were there. And they opened the floor after four people had spoken. Sure. Like four pastors had yep. spoken. And a friend of mine went up and said some things, we need to confess our sins. Okay. And someone put that down and said, oh, well, I've confessed my sins so much. I need to confess. One of the leaders did. And then I came up after my friend and I said, look, this has been a very interesting meeting. Uh, yep. I need to pass one comment. Yeah. Not one of you yep. have mentioned God the Father yep. once okay. in this meeting. Yeah. All right. Now, of course, that didn't go down well. Okay. 
And someone that was as part of that leadership team has said, just to one of my friends, um, I can't work with John. He, he always wrecks my meetings. Okay. Well, okay. They're not her meetings anyway. Yeah. The Lord's meetings. Okay. So, okay, if, if you have... Uh, see, and, uh, where I'm going with this is, when I went back to my seat, there were a couple of guys there I knew. Yes. And one of them said, oh, you don't fear anything. And I said, rubbish. I fear the Lord. Yeah. Right? And it's not about people. Yeah. It's about what does the Lord want? I mean, as, as I said to my wife at various times, what more can they do to us? Yeah. I'm too old now. Right? Well, you're not that old, but well, well, obviously uh, you've, uh, you've learned to deal with this. Uh, well, with, it with rejection. Mean, see, with... we're going through a thing now that um, there's a position which people want me to take in the church. Okay. And the diocese is, is holding it up. Okay. Because they don't actually trust me. We don't know what's going to happen. Yep. Uh, but it's par for the course. Okay. It's just, you get used to it after a while. You keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep praying. It's almost like you expect it to be that way. Well, Tough no. And challenging. No, I was a bit surprised. Okay. Because the whole of the church council or the eldership sent in a letter yes. asking for me to fill up position. Yeah. But it's been held up for me unexpectedly because they've got no reason because the church wants me. Yeah. But that's, that's sort of powerful, for the course, but I didn't anticipate it. Yeah. But what I've learned is, um, you know, my father was a horse trainer. Okay. You want to strengthen the, the legs of the horse, you get them going through sand. Okay. Or through water. Mm-hmm. The Lord wants to strengthen us. You know, Jesus said, Luke 24, 26, was it not necessary, and there's a really strong word there, translated necessary, that the Christ suffer many things and enter into his glory? We know, and I hope these people out there know too, yeah. you want to grow in Christ, you, you suffer. must suffer. Yeah. The greater the vision, the greater the suffering. Read yeah. about Paul, read yeah. about Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all of them. Yeah. And of course, Christ himself. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's spirituality 101. Yeah. But what's happening in so much of the church is, well, it's just rubbish. Okay. It's anem- anemic. Yeah. So you've got a lot of malnourished Christians out there. Anyway, someone asked me to look at something today even about false prophets in America. No surprise. Look, what, look, it's just rubbish. It's a mess. It's a big mess. It, it's a mess and God's stripping things down. He's exposing things. So you're mentoring quite a few people though in town, in, in the city. You've got a few people that you're yeah. discipleship and mentoring. How, how does that go? How does it work? How does it work with you? and? Uh... Well... I've tried to say some th- things to you sometimes. Yes, you have. And right? uh, you've been very objective, which is good and challenging. Well, well, so if I, if I need somebody to speak into my life, tough and rough, I come to you. Well, That's you why know. I don't come to you that often. No, no. But, but the point is, right, uh, if, if somebody comes to me or yeah. I think I need to speak to someone, yeah. often I don't know what it's about. Okay. But if, if it's the Lord, yeah. I'll know and I'll tell them. Okay. It's quite simple. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it'll be something about the pattern of the Lord's working in their life, which they cannot see. Okay. Well, it happens all the time. Now, where they call that a wisdom, knowledge, or whatever, all of which have to do with the cross, actually, um, contrary to what a lot of Pentecostal folk think, right? Because Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Amen. Right? Um, uh, something about how the Lord's applying the cross into a person's life. Okay. And, and that's who I have preached to, pretty much. What's the legacy that you want to pass on to? The people? legacy? Um, I have a book which has been translated into Burmese. hasn't been published yet because they're still in lockdown over there. And they're in perpetual lockdown. Your own book that you wrote? It's been printed. It's been printed here? In... No, it's been printed in Yangon. In Burmese? In Burmese. You wrote it in English? I wrote it in English. Never published it in English? Well, when it's... The Lord said a couple of years ago when I was there, yeah. write a letter for the church in Myanmar. Okay. I said, right, oh Lord, others, other people have wanted me to write, write books at various times. I never thought it was right. Okay, so you so, wrote a church for Myanmar. So when that thing's released in Burmese, I'll release something here. Okay. Not until then. All right. But anyway. What's the heart of that? All right, the heart of it is called The Mystery is Christ. Okay. Biblically, that is the New Testament. Mystery is something once hidden 
for ages and generations in God, now revealed through his apostles and prophets. Okay. So the mystery or the secret of the plan of God yes. is the person of Jesus, okay. for whom the world was made and through whom the world was made. So it's always about Jesus, and that's yes. not a slogan. Yep. It's a truth about the nature of being. Okay. So somewhere early in, in this book, I said, we need to start always where God starts. Now, where does God start? Wrong answer is when he creates. God starts with the lamb slain from before the foundation of the yeah. world. Yeah. All right? So the very basis for everything else that, that God does is the cross. Yeah. He actually started with the cross before All right? he created There's the world. the eternal cross in the heart of God, as they say. Yeah. So in terms of what people call how you know things, epistemology, right? The, the basic thing is the cross. Okay. And when you get to the end of the Bible, there's a lamb. Again. Right? It's the lamb standing as slain. Yeah. Right? But his glory, it's the glory of the lamb will yeah. fill everything. It's summed up in here. Yeah. And that's why I've got a commitment to marketplace ministry and that sort of stuff. Because the glory of the lamb will fill the earth yeah. as the waters cover the sea. So right now, you know, we disciple nations. And that means you disciple business people. Yes. You disciple lawyers. You disciple plumbers. Yeah. Besides dis discipling people who come to church on a Sunday. Yeah. But it's all in the way of Christ. So it's someone once said, a very well-known theologian, actually. He said, um, <clears throat> it's not our story with a part for God. It's Christ's story with a part for us. Correct. I think that's powerful. Well, it's absolutely true. It's, it's what the whole Bible's about. Yeah. And then uh, the Lord lays hold of us yeah. and brings us into Christ's story. Yeah. Now, the way he's done that with me, obviously, is let me get really miserable and paranoid and all the rest of it, then send a Bible so yeah. I could read the Bible yeah. and then everything I've talked about. But it's not my story, Yeah. right? Whoever else you've got, it's not their God in this series, it's not their story, yeah. it's Christ's story with a yeah. part for us. Now, that's how God the Father gets glory through the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Yeah. When people understand that in the present or in the future, they know they're going somewhere. That's right. Back into the Godhead. Our lives My are hidden with Christ in God. That's wonderful. It's not complicated. No. But it's too challenging for most contemporary, lazy, Western Christians. So it comes back to the basics, the simplicity, the gospel. the simplicity of the gospel. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's always been simple. Well, you know, I say to people lots of times, I, uh, there's a little bit of a slogan of mine. It's always simple, but it's never easy. No. It's, it's always simple. Because the gospel is simple. The kingdom of God is simple. It belongs it's to just the our self, our, our selfish inclination is to get in the way. Well, our, our thoughts, our wisdom. Well, our... look, you, you, you and I know most people are quite ambitious. Yeah. The Lord hates ambition. Whether it's someone in this room needs to hear that or someone out there. I think the Lord, I need to hear that. The Lord hates ambition. Yeah. Because it belongs to the devil. Okay. God spoke to me once in an in interesting way. Um, someone is, was in the city from interstate. And the Lord woke them up in, in, in the middle of the night and said, it's the sand groper spirit that will destroy revival okay. in Western Australia. They didn't even know what a sand groper was. Now, a sand groper is a subterranean insect that is, lives underground, of course, which eats the roots Good. of plants so that they don't bear fruit. Okay, so they're still yeah. green, but they don't bear fruit. Yeah, they look like it's wheat crops, eh? Yeah. It's not going to bear fruit yeah. because they, the, the, the roots are eaten. Anyway, I said to the Lord once, what is this sand roper spirit? Okay. He directed me to James 3, which says there's two types of wisdom. Wisdom from above, which yeah. is heavenly and peaceful and full of good yeah. fruits, and the wisdom from below which is full of selfish ambition, okay. right? Yeah. Uh, no Christian or no church can ever grow until the Lord has dealt with that. Dealt his... with selfish ambition or ego or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And, you know, that's why I've had so much rejection, I'm sure. 
Yeah, because you say it how it is. No, because the Lord wants to get rid of my selfish ambition. As well, as everybody well, That's the else main is. thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> get rid of well, John, thank you so much for uh, sharing your heart today and uh, for being so honest and uh, truthful and challenging us. Um, you've challenged me and I'm sure you've challenged our listeners and our viewers. And uh, yeah, it's just wonderful to see how you centered your life on Jesus and especially how in this latter part of your life you, you want to focus on the simplicity of the gospel to make sure that Jesus shines um, in every nation and in every sphere of marketplace. Um, this is Kingdom Stories and you've just uh, heard the testimony of Dr. John Yates. It's been a privilege to have him on and um, carry on. Uh, look for more stories here on Kingdom Stories. If you like what you see, please share it, uh, distribute it uh, with others as well. Subscribe to our channel, rate it if you can. We would love to get five stars, of course. And uh, just pray for us so we can share and bring you more stories from down under. My name is Nathaniel Costia, and this are uh, Kingdom Stories from down under from Australia. Be blessed. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate, and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.